This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And now, here's Ted Wallachian. My special guest is an award-winning broadcaster, a journalist who launched the iconic television program Fashion Television, which aired for nearly three decades in more than 130 countries. She has also received honorary doctorates from St. Mary's and OCAD universities, is a recipient of a special achievement award from the Canadian Academy of Cinema and Television, and if that's not enough, as a star on Canada's Walk of Fame, and if that's not enough, has been named to the Order of Canada. In other words, what the hell is she doing on this show? Jeannie <laughs> Becker, how are you? You're, you're, you're overqualified for this program. <laughs> how are you doing, by the way? How's your health? Uh, good. Good. I still um, have this adjuvant therapy going on, these treatments with a fabulous miracle drug called Herceptin, which I take every three weeks uh, because I am um, estrogen positive. That's the type of breast cancer I have. So these are sort of estrogen blockers, this uh, incredible drug. So um, uh, anyway, besides that, um, I'm just doing great. I finished my radiation therapy, you know, like chemo was last summer. Uh, my hair's growing back. Uh, I'm just feeling really good. I'm getting my strength back and, and I'm just feeling incredibly grateful and great blessed. Can you tell me what, if you can recall when you found out when you were first diagnosed with breast cancer, what went through your mind? Oh, like, you know, you start, uh, thinking, are you going to see next summer? Are you ever going to, you know, do all that stuff on your bucket list? I mean, it's like game over. You start kind of imagining your own funeral. I mean, it, cancer is probably the scariest word in, you know, in our, the English language, I think. I um, and I'm hoping to eradicate that fear because when I first went to that really dark, horrifying place, I just really started talking to myself and saying, you know, I love my life too much. And even if I only have six months left, or, you know, and I don't know why I jumped to those horrible conclusions before I even saw my oncologist. Um, I thought if I even only have even a short time left, I don't want to live those, you know, weeks or months or, or, or years in fear. I want to live in the light. And it was absolutely a paramount importance for me to find the light and and find the positive and just stay positive that's the only thing you can do to get you through it's everything that i was brought up on well you, you look good and, and you, you sound good and, and you got a big smile on your face for people can't see which is which is really great let i want to talk a little bit about about your early part of your career because there was some in in researching uh, your your history there's a couple of things that popped up that i was not aware of like like for example i didn't realize that you initially studied acting in new york and then you went and studied mime in paris but then as you got into in you you, you got into radio uh, i guess at first you we worked for uh, for for cbc radio and then then you went on to chum and then and we'll talk about all the other great things that have happened but did, did at any time in your career did mime help you yeah i think it helps me all the time every time whatever it's made me incredibly aware of the power of of corporal expression and you know i'm, I'm always talking with my hands and i always um, a very animated kind of uh, presenter, mm -hmm. as most people know about me, you know, and, and I think that, you know, anything you can do, especially, you know, if you're not relying on language, I mean, how wonderful to be able to communicate in a universal way, in that way. So yeah, I'm, I'm conscious of it all the time. I mean, even, even if I'm sitting there, I'm, you know, at the shopping channel on Thursday nights doing my show, you know, I'm thinking about the way I'm crossing my legs, or I'm thinking about the way I'm, I'm reaching out, just I'm always aware of, of how I'm expressing myself physically. Right. And wonderful, yeah. You, uh, you started, as I mentioned, uh, in, at CBC, and then you went, you went to Chum. 
And back in 1979, when Chum owned, I guess, was Chum owning, did they own City TV already at that point? Yeah. So in 1978, I moved back to Toronto from St. John's, Newfoundland, after having worked at CBC Radio for three, only my artist in the province, and I got a job in radio. <laughs> I started working at Chum as their good news girl, you know. Mm. J.R. Wood, great program director, hired me, and, and it was fabulous. And then that same year, Chum bought City TV. All right. so 1979, they decided to start cross-promoting some of their radio personalities onto TV. And they plucked me and J.D. Roberts, who was like a boss jock, you know, again, Chum AM, mm -hmm. and us over to City TV to co-host a groundbreaking music magazine show, The New Music. Right. Now, J.D. Roberts, from uh, people who don't know, went on to become John Roberts in the United States. He was at CBS, and I guess he's at, at Fox. He's, I think he's a, still the, the senior White House correspondent for Fox, he's for Fox News, I think. <laughs> Much to the yeah disbelief of so many who remember him you know, from yeah. being those metalheads for all those years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess he's still interviewing some metalheads in the world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's really, really not that far <laughs> removed politics and, and rock and roll, if you stop to think about it. Uh, um, trailblazing and it, this, is, this expression works in 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 regards to your your career. Fashion, the the fashion industry could never have come up with something that you came up for them, which was which was fashion television, uh, groundbreaking the first of its kind and as i mentioned you went on for three decades almost yes that is that's incredible yep. in over 130 different countries yep. how did the, the concept first come to you well it wasn't my idea to put fashion on television um because a really bright young producer by the name of Jay Levine, who was working in the City TV promotions department, had that idea. I mean, we were living in this, you know, age of uh, videos. Uh, we, I was doing the music show at the time, of course, and putting a lot of these music videos um, on the uh, air. But all of a sudden, a few um, fashion houses out there decided they might try to produce some fashion videos. So Moses Neimer, who was running the plays at the time, would send these fashion over fashion videos over to me. And I actually I was hosting the show New Music with Daniel Richler at the time. And um, you know, he said, you know, we we need to format we need to a platform for some of these videos. You know, maybe you can put them on the new music. And we we sort of thought, well, I don't know if they're really right for the new music. Jay Levine was working in the promos department and he loved the idea of fashion as a sexy kind of thing to put on TV. And he, he thought, well, maybe we could put these um, fashion videos on a show, a separate kind of show, and they would get a fashion VJ, you know, one of these hot mm -hmm. models to present it. And, you know, so I heard that they, you know, Jay wanted to do that and they wanted to do a pilot for this fashion television show. And I was kind of getting tired of the rock and roll thing. Like I thought, you know, if I have to interview Rod Stewart once more, I'm going to lose it. Or I, I'm sick of riding smoke. <laughs> I thought, I, you know, I love the idea of fashion on TV. So I um, asked Jay and the, the group that were putting that pilot together if I could maybe host this show. And they're going, no, we want a hot young model to host it. We don't. So I was incensed and I marched up to the station manager's office and I said, come on, I paid my dues here. I'm looking for the next big thing. I worked my butt off. You got to let me do it. And somehow they said, OK, OK, we'll let you host this first episode, but we don't want any talking heads. Just introduce the fashion videos. And then I said, well, mm, I'd really like to interview these designers the way we interviewed the rock stars all these years. And they weren't for that at all. But after the first episode aired, the pilot, they said, you know what? It might be interesting if you go and interview the designers after all. So I went off to New York and interviewed like Bob Mackey and Betsy Johnson and and uh, so the new uh, the fashion television, I should say, was born. And uh, yeah, it, it ended up being an incredible, uh, incredible success, uh, as you said, in 130 different countries around the world for 27 years. Woo, what a ride. It, you know what was really incredible about it as well? You would think, okay, so we're going to do the show about fashion. And so uh, women will watch it and there's not, no, no men are going to watch it at all. 
uh, but uh, wrong. Uh, the men loved it because uh, the clothing was um, yeah, pretty Listen, out I'm there. The clothing or lack thereof. <laughs> or their lack thereof. Yes, yeah, exactly. Actually, that show was the most popular show in prisons across the <laughs> but apparently, yeah, well, because, I could, you know, we showed a lot of TNA, and you know, yeah. hey, why not? That's what they were showing on the runway. I, as much as I love fashion, I wasn't that kind of a fashionista. I, I didn't ask those questions either about, you know, hemlines and silhouettes and shades of beige. I mean, I was really interested in the creative process and the incredible, larger than life. Of egos and icons on the scene, like the, these personalities that were just as, if not more, interesting than all those rock and rollers that I've been interviewing all those years. So we had a different kind of approach to our show, and we didn't talk about trends, and we didn't talk about the usual, you know, thing that you would think, you know, oh, yes, a women's fashion magazine should address these issues. I mean, we were talking much more about the creative zeitgeist at the time, and. Uh, that whole mm -hmm. idea of you know just shocking people i think because city tv wasn't afraid to show nipple i mean when no. they pulled the show no. to vh1 in the u.s of course they blurred out all the nipple shots but whatever yeah really uh Jeannie becker the great Jeannie becker is with me right now when when the show first took off did you get an opportunity to to, to talk to some of the listeners and and I, i'm curious as to whether women would say to you yeah i sit and i watch with my husband or with my boyfriend and and he pretends that he really is into fashion but i know why he's really watching well listen and people saw that show as family viewing it was had cross-generational appeal there's no question like there's so many kids now that, kids, I call them, you know, the, the 40 year olds that come up to me now that say, oh, yeah, I used to, you know, sit there with my grandmother and, you know, a Saturday night and watch that show. Or, you know, it, of course, because there was something in it for the guys and something in it for the girls and something in it for young people and, and something in it for the older people. So, um, yeah, there's no, I, I was never surprised by that either because we never wanted to do a show just for women. I mean, that's totally not what that whole was about and right. Jay himself you know I it kind of drove me a bit crazy sometimes because I thought it's, it was a bunch of guys producing that show for the most part I mean I was there in the field with my microphone or sometimes you know putting stories together or pre-producing stories but for the most part you know the, the, the editors were male the certainly the producers were male you know and it was just a sometimes bothered me a little bit because you know they would shoot the way the camera guys used to shoot the shows they would only you know concentrate mostly you know from the waist up because they wanted you know close-ups of the boobs and I thought you know what about the shoes why aren't we showing the feet you know, I, didn't want to. I didn't understand why I remember once being in a little outport in uh in Newfoundland, just outside of St. John's, a couple of fishermen were, you know, walking by and they recognized me and they goes, oh, my dear, that's a girl from TV. <laughs> 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 hey, I became this for Tit TV. Not bad. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Tit TV coming <laughs> to a neighborhood prison. <laughs> uh, uh, Jeannie Beck Becker, I guess, as, as I mentioned, is, is my guest. During the course of... of the years that 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 fashion tv ran you talked to virtually every major fashion house and every major fashion designer of of our of our time now and the reason i mention this is because i want to get your opinion on something here i watched the other day specifically for the second time actually the devil wears prada because i knew i was going to be interviewing you and i said i wanted to ask you this you saw it, the devil wears prada obviously meryl streep's brilliant in that how close to the reality is that there's a definite um, snobbery in fashion. Definitely yeah. people who are mean to others, underlings, especially in fashion. It's a very uh, judgmental kind of place um, because it's so image driven. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I uh, you know, things that happened over the years made me cry a few thousand times. It can be a very dark place. I mean, you know, if you... Uh, watch the documentary series that is currently streaming on Crave TV called Kingdom of Dreams um, that I co-produced. 
It's a four part series that really looks at the world of fashion through a very dark lens. Um, I wasn't actually totally on board with the, telling the story that particular way, but the brilliant uh, producers that I was involved with uh, were adamant about telling that story. And that will give you a good insight into the cutthroat uh, nature of the fashion, mm -hmm. because it really is a snake pit a lot. Time. Yeah. Um, you know, if it was a total snake that I could never have survived for as long as I did because I'm too sensitive. I tried to see the good and the light. But uh, yeah, it, it could be pretty ruthless. Ted Wallachin returns in a moment. I've had the great fortune to say that I've been associated with one of Toronto's finest names in men's clothing for more than 25 years. Tom's Place. Founded by Tom Mahalik's father in 1958, Tom's Place offers brand name men's apparel at unbeatable prices. But more than that, they boast a long serving, knowledgeable, and friendly staff that can assist you whether you're looking for casual or formal attire. And they have plenty of first class tailors on site. In addition, Tom and his family are well known for their philanthropic work. So if you're looking to deal with great people who can fulfill your clothing desires at outstanding prices, do yourself a favor and visit Tom's Place. They're open weekdays from 11 to 6, Saturdays 10 to 5, and Sundays noon to 5. You'll find Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Or check them out online at toms-place.com. Tom's Place will suit you. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend, Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETF Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's 1-866-309-0387, or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca. That's info at etpcanada.ca. Now back to Ted Wallachan. And who were the good people that you met, the people that you, you genuinely um, admired and, and who became oh, well, friends? so many. Well, so many of the great designers, like uh, the late, great Alexander McQueen, of course. I had an incredible um, affinity for him, like a pension. Oh, he was just magical. He was a poet and he was so sensitive. He was a true artist, um, sadly, who, who suffered so much uh, at, at the hands of big business uh, fashion. Um, Karl Lagerfeld, who was, I consider like one of my mentors. He was always talking about looking ahead. You know, it was always about going on to the next. And I found him incredibly inspiring. I mean, he was so irreverent too. And conversing with him was like, you know, playing tennis with someone, you know, he'd lob these zingers at you and you just had to come right back. But so many models, mm -hmm. designers, photographers that I really did you know, some of them, yes, I just knew them. I'd interview them in the field at backstage at a show. Um, I didn't necessarily go out for dinners with them or hang out with them socially, but there were a few that I really did get close to, and uh, that was just such a such a gift. Did you get all this great clothing tossed at you? Yeah, I got quite a few cool presents. <laughs> they get <laughs> good with things. Um, but, of course, also um, all those years that I was hosting – the show, I would try to wear Canadian uh, fashion as much as possible because I really felt our Canadian fashion designers needed and deserved the attention. So I had clothing deals with uh, greats like Lita Bidet. She doesn't design any longer, but she was a brilliant fashion designer. And so many of the great Canadian fashion designers um, that were around at the time, I got to strut their stuff. And that, uh, that made me very proud as well. And you have your own uh, eponymous label. Mm -hmm. I had a few different clothing lines. Um, the Jeannie Becker line that I originally did for Eaton's was a mm -hmm. great success. But sadly, after a couple of years, Eaton's, you know, shut down. So couldn't do that anymore. And then I, I did a little uh, thing for Sears um, that was called Inside Out, which was kind of 
yoga underwear line. And then I did um, edit by Jeannie Becker, which um, did really well um, for quite a few years at the Bay. But I really got to the point where I started questioning how much stuff we're putting out there. And like, I hate to bite the hand that feeds me, but the biggest conversation and the most crucial conversation in fashion right now is um, the conversation surrounding sustainability. Right. And, uh, making sure that everything that is produced is produced ethically and sustainably, and that we're not just putting more junk out there because the fashion industry is one of the greatest polluters uh, of our planet. So that's a whole other thing. I mean, I'm still selling fashion and I'm proudly on TSC, the shopping channel. You know, we sell a lot of great, uh, great clothing there. And obviously we need to keep these industries alive. You know, that being said, I think we have to be careful. We have to shop better. We have to uh, perhaps think along the lines that less is more, you mm -hmm. know, you know, hang on to our clothes a little bit longer, appreciate them uh, a lot more. And it's, it seems to me that there are more and more options for people now to buy secondhand clothing. Absolutely. But and, and there's nothing wrong with that. For the longest time, people will say, "Well, I'm, I'm not going to go buy wear somebody else's clothes." Yeah. But now it's like it's it's yeah. If you can if you can get a you know a fifteen hundred dollar jacket that was worn for a half a season for you know seventy five bucks, you, you'd be nuts not to buy it. Exactly, and and the, there's such a, a, a an incredible appreciation of vintage course because some of the yeah. coolest stuff is stuff from days gone by and you can find so much of that stuff if you're really a smart shopper and you you know you pick through stuff even in uh, thrift stores you can find some incredible things you know and i was just reading something that they're saying that the next big trend now with handbags because some uh, celebrities have been seen wearing their designer handbags but really beat up designer handbags because that makes a real statement too so all these old handbags that were around you know back in the day that were selling for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars you know it, it, the more beat up they are the better because it sort of makes that statement yes i care about great design but it's important to hang on to it for as long as possible and sure strut something that's a little distressed there's a, a kind of uh, innate cool to that what about uh, copies like you, you know some uh, of them I mean, they're all over the place. I mean, every, every major brand has been copied. In some cases, it's pretty difficult to, to tell the difference unless you're really keen of eye. Absolutely. But, you know, blah. I don't know. I'm all about authenticity. And, uh, you know, I encourage others to be, too. And true, most people can't afford a, a, a Louis Vuitton bag, you know, and even a secondhand Louis Vuitton bag or a, or a fifthhand Louis Vuitton bag can get quite pricey. But yeah knockoffs you know you know okay i'll <laughs> I, I i can't say that i've never had a knockoff bag because um once i did get a knockoff bag uh, i think i wore it about twice it made me sick i, I don't know there was just something about it, it i just seemed felt like a fraud carrying a knockoff bag but hey if that's what you like to do i mean the, i'm just telling you from my point of view i mean i you know live and let live if that's what you want to do, fine. But I think for the designers, especially, um, that's a real blow. It's not a very nice thing to do. Some of these fashion companies, on the other hand, you know, I don't know what to say. LVMH is currently run by the richest man in the world, Bernard Arnault, who got rich off the backs of these brilliantly talented designers. Mm -hmm. Some people want to sort of, you know, screw with LVMH. And, you know, I, I don't know what to say. Yeah. It, it seems to me that... Um... The big difference between men's fashion and women's fashion is women's fashion encompasses everything from head to toe. And what is focused in on men's fashion now, especially, are these these designer collector running shoes, these sneakers, the you know, that Yeezy and uh, and Michael Jordan and all these. They put out these sneakers and they're like eight hundred, nine hundred dollars and people buy them and they never wear them. And then they become and now they're worth five thousand dollars. And it seems to me like, wow, people are trading in running shoes. It's just yeah. bizarre. The currencies, it just, it, it's nuts. But these things are, uh, you know, uh, artifacts of popular culture. And, uh, you know, it, it, I guess they're considered, you know, art in a funny kind of way. You know, art to wear, perhaps. And, yeah. uh, you know, if paintings and, and, and other, you know, pieces of art can appreciate and value in that way and be considered that precious, I guess, you know, well, maybe 
there's something to be said about these uh, pop cultural artifacts. I don't know. I mean, uh, fashion that's that precious. I mean, I can see it with the couture when the workmanship, the craftsmanship in some of these pieces is like just mind blowing. I mean, it, the work that goes into some of these couture pieces, you can understand why a dress can be a hundred thousand dollars. I'm not saying, you know, and you should get a dress for a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, if you have that kind of money and that's what you want to spend it on, that's nice. But, you know, sure, it's it, fashion uh, knows no bounds and especially fashion uh, as art, because there is a very, you know, very thin line between the two. And, and, and some fashion, I believe, is actually art. Some not so much, not at all. Yeah. You were inducted into uh, Canada's Walk of Fame back in uh, the year 2016. Were you completely taken by surprise? by surprise I thought mm, okay a lot of people know my name I mean if you've been on TV for as long as I've been on and um, my name's been kind of you know out there for decades a lot of people you know thought of me you know as a household name or think of me as a household name so how great to be recognized in that way I think the Walk of Fame is a wonderful thing you know yeah it ballyhoo it enough in uh, in LA, like in Hollywood, you know, the Hollywood Walk of Stars, or whatever they call it. It's you know, it's such a big honor, but we never, you know, it, it we never really, I don't think, um, uh, respect our Canadian talent maybe as much as they do stateside. So when an opportunity like that comes along, I think uh, you know, the Walk of Fame, wonderful thing, and to have my star located just like around the corner from where my dad had his old slipper factory back in the day on Adelaide street, you know, wow. and, and my dad used to like walk that sidewalk, you know, this is way before I got my star, but there was just a kind of a sentimental, you know, yeah. uh, feeling about it for me. This is the city I grew up in. How, how proud I am to have my name on the side. And then when you became a member of the order of Canada, no, that was, yeah, that, that, that was, you know, probably the biggest honor of, of my career and uh, thus far. I never know what else could happen, but but uh, I can't tell you how much that meant to me. I mean, that was just astounding. Uh, you know, especially when I think of my parents, you know, who came here, um, penniless uh, immigrants in 1948. Uh, they came from Poland uh, by way of Austria. They were Holocaust survivors, uh, you know, grew up in a small little shtetl in Poland with absolutely nothing. and. And really just only dream that maybe one day um, they could afford their their kids the kind of life that they had could only, only, only dream about. And uh, the fact that I had, you know, risen to that point um, in, in this society, in this culture, it, it was an incredible honor. And one that, I, you know, like I wear my, look at, I'm here, I'm sitting here, as, you know, in my sweatshirt, right? I'm at my country house. And look what I'm wearing, Ted. I'm wearing my yes. Canada pin because I wear it every day of my life. I, I, I'd, be, I'd wear it. I'd put it on my skin if I got one. I wouldn't even need clothing for that. And I wear it and I put it on every day because every day it reminds me. Um, and David Johnson, you know, governor general at the time, he presented me with this uh, glorious uh, accessory <laughs> with the award. Um, you know, he said, I hope that this is not just, you know, the culmination of, of a career for, he said, you know, to all those who received their awards at Rideau Hall that day, he said, uh, you know, I hope this will only, you know, inspire you to go further because, and this to me is a reminder, this little tiny snowflake order of Canada pin is my reminder every day that I got to go further and I got to be the best possible person that I could yeah. possibly be. So yeah, very inspiring. Were your parents alive when you were awarded the mm. pin? My dad sadly wasn't. He passed away in uh, 1988. But my mom was in her last year because I actually uh, got the award in 2014. Like they right. announced 2013. I got it in 2014. But my mom was suffering from Parkinson's and dementia it started to set in. And she just wasn't in great shape to come to Ottawa with me, sadly. But she watched it on uh you know because it was live streamed um and that was a very proud proud moment for her uh, no question yeah i guess 
absolutely the pinnacle really of, of, of what I've been able to accomplish um, in my life. Although, although, although I, I still hope to accomplish a whole lot more. Sometimes I only just scratch the surface. And, and your, your colleagues, because I've, I don't know, in the years so I've been doing this and I don't know how many years in radio prior, prior to this, I've interviewed a lot of people who have become members of the Order of Canada. And I often wonder, like, if you get like a secret handshake, like when you see each other walking, like the, you know, like, like the Masons. No, but I do say what I see a lot of, uh, you know, my friends or people that, you know, have, have the Order of Canada or that I know they have the Order of Canada and they don't wear their pin. And I'm always like, hmm, you should wear that pin every day. Oh, yeah, right. Like some people, I don't know, they forget to wear it or they don't want to or it doesn't mean as much to them. I don't know why. I'm always, you know, sort of <laughs> saying to them, you know, come on, wear that pin. I think uh, they should. Most, now, most people don't even know what it looks like and don't really know what it is. So many people have just said to me, what is that thing you're wearing? You know, which is wonderful because then I can launch into you know the importance of it and why I wear it. But um, yeah, I, I, there, there's no secret society or anything. <laughs> people really wanting to get into the club, no question. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So let, let's talk about what you're doing now with, uh, with, with, the, shopping, with the shopping channel. You've got... Uh, a show called Style Matters, and uh, you're the style editor, actually, for Shopping Channel. Yeah, for the Shopping uh, Channel. Well, now they call it today's Shopping Choice, but I still just call it the Shopping Channel, TSC. I yeah. it's Rogers. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful, feel-good place because it's, uh, it's kind of a happy place, and we just love selling that stuff. And there's a lot, it was especially, well, during the pandemic, obviously, online shopping just went through the roof, and this is you know, a, a added value online shopping because you can actually see, in, in my case, when I'm selling garments and accessories, you can see the stuff in motion and we can actually explain to you how you can wear it, how you can style it. And, and I just feel like all those gals that watch the show or guys, maybe some guys watch it too. We don't really sell um, much men's fashion, but still I think some men watch the show, but we just have such a good time because I think they curl up with their glass of wine on a Thursday night and we're on for about, um, 10 weeks uh, in the spring and 10 weeks in the fall. Um, and it's a live two hour show every week. So who doesn't love doing live TV? I mean, for mm -hmm. me, such a blast. You never know what's going to happen. And the designers come on. And so I get to interview the designers and really talk to women where they live. I mean, for a long time, I was just telling these kind of lofty stories about fashion and design and art and, you know, which was cool and fun. But now I get to really talk about about the trends and about um, you know how to mix stuff up and about how to you know, how to present yourself to the world and uh, it's just a blast. I really enjoy doing it. And uh, what am I, in my eighth year now, I started in 2015. So yeah, we're in our, in our eighth year of doing that show, and it's just been uh, an absolute joy. Hmm. And have you got any other projects that you're working on that you can oh, share with us? Well, uh, a few things, including writing a book. So, ah writing another book. I've written five, three kids books and two other memoirs that are now out of print. Um, but I'm very excited about uh, this book. It's with a, a great uh, publisher. I can't, I'm just about to, you know, sign on the dotted line. So I don't want to give that away, but it's going to be a great book and it's going to be a book about life lessons. Um, and uh, boy, I've, uh, I've had the privilege of learning an incredible number of lessons from some of the most astoundingly um brilliant creative people on the planet as you can imagine yeah um yeah very, very much looking forward to that and very much looking forward to continuing to raise awareness about um breast cancer the importance of uh early detection and how everyone should get out there and get a mammogram you know especially annually um and you know if you're under a certain age and it's hard to get one maybe you should you know I, I don't know that that's a whole other thing we have to try and lobby to, to make sure that every woman who feels that she wants a mammogram can get one um but that's important i i really want to try and eradicate some of the fear surrounding breast cancer because if detected early it can not only be treated it can be cured and that's really important mm -hmm. and um it's it's just an awareness that i've found myself in this place that I never imagined I'd be in, but I'm just going to use it to, uh, to my advantage and hopefully to the advantage of others where I can really uh, help spread the word and help people feel better about their lives and, and take some of the fear 
out of cancer because it's not a death sentence anymore. No, yeah, it isn't. Thank God for that. And, and and good for you. It looks good on you. I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to see that you that you've taken on that challenge and and a challenge it is, no no doubt about it. Jeannie, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. I'm I'm, I'm so glad to see to see you. I'm so glad to see that you're doing well and you sound great and always a lot of fun. So much love, Ted. Really, it's just a joy to, a joy to have known you over the years. I've always had like such incredible respect for you. You're just such a talent, such a such a mensch, such a great guy. And uh, this has been a joy reminiscing with you and. And just chatting. And I shaved for you today too. <laughs> God, I think you're handsome. <laughs> I I don't do that for men, by the way. When I interview them, I don't shave for them. I want that more Grizzly Adams look. <laughs> you take care. We'll talk again soon. All right. So much love. Ted. Take care. You too. So once again, thanks for being with us. If it's your first time here, we appreciate it, and hope you come back, and hope you recommend our podcast to your friends. And don't forget, follow us. Also, don't forget, if you get a chance, go online, fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallace and Podcast has been brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And Tom's Place, for the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.